And this relates a lot to sort of typical practice for how zoning is done today. Most zoning as it's practiced today, most zoning districts deal with use and density as the primary measure first and foremost. So that's almost all what all of our discussions are about, our use and density. It's residential, it's how many units to the acre. Um, it deals somewhat with management of that space as well as you know who's going to use it, who's going to make sure things happen in a certain way, and a little bit about form. A little, a little bit about building form, where a building may sit on a property, for example. So we have setback laws or setback uh, restrictions in many of our zoning districts. But the form issues tend to be tend to be second or third down the list in terms of what our priorities are. A form-based code flips that on its head. It's basically saying we're going to put the rules of form and building design number one. That's the number one issue that is a, uh, that will that we'll use as we review applications and projects as they come through. We're still gonna talk about management, we're still gonna talk about use and density, but they move down the list on the areas of concern. Because the idea is, we have done a plan, we have done a specific plan for an area, we know what it, we want it to have, what kind of character we want it to have, the most important thing is dealing with the form of it. So, um, this, you know, this is again a little different deal from, from a contemporary practice, we, we're often very good in planning and sort of measuring things, you know, and, and, and measuring things after the fact. But we, we too often try to use those measurement tools as an actual tool to predict what we, what we hope will happen. So for example, FAR you know, is a really common tool that most of our communities will use as a way to measure density. Again, thinking about use and density, we do floor area ratio a lot as a common measurement. <coughs> And so, but the problem is, you know, it's a statistical measure that has absolutely no relation to how, what your experience could be on the ground. Both of these drawings indicate a building that would have an FAR of one. You, know, you could have a one-story building that covers the whole site, or you could have a multi-story building that has a small footprint. They both have very dramatically different impacts on what your experience is as somebody who might walk around that building. And so you will find in most form-based codes that uh, a lot of measurement tools like FAR and things that you may be used to either don't exist or they're well down the list of things that are of a concern. Uh, we, they may be tools that are interesting as an analysis after the fact, but we don't use them as a way to drive whether an application will be, uh, or whether it's acceptable or not for a given project. So, Another problem is, and, and again, this is why we're, we're sort of at the stage where we're, where we're encouraging form-based codes, is you know, many of our communities have done plans that have fantastic policy language, but we don't change the underlying rules, the legal mechanisms to actually implement those policies. Um, so for example, I just picked on one, one local plan, but this is, this is from the Main Street Corridor Plan here in Kansas City, Missouri. And there are these fantastic policy statements that are <coughs> in this document that say everything about walkability and creating interesting pedestrian uh, spaces and traditional strip commercial development shall be discouraged and replaced by mixed use walkable environments. And as you scroll through that document, you see things like urban design and mixed use and nodes and activity areas just you know on, on nearly every page. But yet, when a building comes to be built, it, it ends up like the one on the right which is a very traditional, very typical strip center that sits back from the street. There's really nothing about that that meets any of the policy intent of the plan. And the reason is because while the plan suggests a number of things that people really would like to have, the underlying mechanism which really controls what can be built and will be built, the zoning, was not changed. Then that process of development and what could be approved and how things were to be built was not changed. And so what will happen, what, what you'll see in many cases is that this was not an open zoning, this was part of a redevelopment district that then had a plan that said, you know, where some buildings might be. But you'll see this all the time where you'll have an open zoning district. You may, you may say this policy language, but you have a C2 district, for example, that really allows people to do kind of anything and you really don't have any mechanism to actually implement the plan that you said you wanted to do. So an, another critical uh, aspect, and this is something that came up quite a bit in Blue Springs, 
was that a lot of our zoning districts that uh, were applied to uh, pre-World War II areas, you know, a lot we, when we developed zoning in, in the 30s, the 20s and 30s, but really wasn't kind of widely implemented until the 40s and 50s, it was, it was overlaid over, you know, an awful lot of neighborhoods that were built before that. And so we had sort of these Euclidean zoning districts that we created that we went ahead and put on top of older neighborhoods. Well, unfortunately, one of the things that happened as cities sort of rushed to, to do zoning and implement zoning is they didn't look to see or didn't care that the zoning didn't actually match the condition on the ground. And so we have an awful lot of pre-World War II neighborhoods where the underlying zoning condition essentially makes almost everything non-conforming. And it's obviously a tremendous <coughs> problem uh, because you, you, the basic idea that an entire neighborhood should be that is virtually illegal, uh, it is you know that's a tremendous issue in your community, especially if a house gets torn down, if a house burns down, um, if somebody wants to build an addition onto their house. We had a number of things in, in Blue Springs and the historic district adjacent to downtown, where, where the underlying zoning caused such a problem that anytime somebody wanted to do a room addition, a garage addition, but uh, something that was actually in spirit with the character of that neighborhood, they had to seek a whole variety of variances um, through the city planning process in order just to do those simple things. And so this is a very common problem. These three houses here in this neighborhood, uh, which are a very desirable sort of traditional house type, these bungalows, these are actually uh, non-conforming in that neighborhood and frankly in most of our zoning districts this would not be uh, an allowed uh, use or an allowed uh, example of that type of house the locks are too narrow the houses are too close to the street the way that the landscaping and parking and the setbacks are handled would actually not conform in most of our zoning districts and so one goal that we always try to, to promote with form based codes in an existing neighborhood is a primary goal should be to essentially legalize much of what is on the ground uh, today. That, you know, if, if just because it's an older area, just because there are 35 foot wide lots does not mean that those should be non conforming. Those should absolutely be conforming uses and because that is the desirable condition of that neighborhood. One, one, one issue with that that you will see though is that, is that codes that are applied in infill situations will be more complex than in refill situations. So that, that's something I to carry out. So another aspect of this that's really critical is that we're trying to put in place a process with these codes that actually makes them very easy to implement and to do as well. As I go through the elements of these codes today, you'll see that they're very complicated. There's a lot of new jargon. There's a lot of new things to learn. Uh, there's a lot of elements uh, to each of these particular codes that are very specific. Um, but the trade-off for that is we want the application review process to be very easy on the backside. So we expect a lot of people up front, but uh, in many cases, we've actually set up a review and approval process that is mostly, um, that can be handled by uh, city administration and staff, uh, or perhaps with a separate review board, separate even out of the planning commission. Uh, something that really exists to expedite the approval of projects according to the code. So what we try to say is that the idea is you're doing a plan, you've, you've done this plan, you've gone through a full public involvement effort, you've done everything you need to do to really uh, to take care of the fact that you brought people on board and you've got consensus on the vision for a specific neighborhood. Now, put the code in place, let it live. Let it live for a little while. You know, let it, let it exist, let people do projects. Mistakes are gonna happen. You know, things are gonna happen you may not have expected, but resist that temptation to, to tinker with the code every six months or so. Let it live for a few years and see what's working and what's not. 